Thank you. Uh, so, welcome everyone. Um, we wanted to give a talk about uh, Shio, the data processing framework that uh, Spotify uses internally for all uh, batch and streaming uh, pipelines that we have. Um, and the reason for that is a bit that two years ago, one of our colleagues, Neville, introduced Shio here on this conference. Uh, and ever since, uh, we've been using it, and it's now the default at Spotify. So with two years of experience and a little bit of pain in our minds now, we want to share like the stuff we've been doing with it and the work we've done uh, on Shio. Uh, so for a quick introduction, uh, my name is Bram. Uh, I've been an infrastructure engineer at Spotify for a bit over two years now. Um, I've been a Scala developer for about a year uh, since we started writing pipelines in Scala. Um, and this is my first time speaking on a public conference. So thank you all for being here with me. <laughs> all right, so um, I'm much older than him. Uh, my name is Julian. I've been a data engineer at Spotify for the last eight months or so in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, I've been a Scala developer for a little more than that, eight years. And uh, yeah, I've, I contribute to open source projects um, since a few years now. Um, yeah, that's it. Next. Right. So two years ago, we would have started with like a raise of hand, like who knows Spotify here? I guess by now everyone kind of knows Spotify, but in case you don't, it's a music streaming company. Um, just to give you an idea of the size that we work, uh, that we operate on, uh, we have over 190 million monthly active users. Um, almost 90 million of those are premium subscribers, so they pay us every month. Uh, we have over 40 million songs that you can uh, listen to and over 3 billion user-generated playlists. Um, and to give an idea of what that results uh, in, in terms of data, uh, every day we ingest over 200 terabytes of client events. And an event here is, for example, every time you click on a button that's part of an A-B test, or every time you finish playing a song, uh, the device you listen on will send an event to Spotify, and that's what we tend to refer to as events. Um, so yeah, that's over 200 terabyte a day. Um, we process that with several thousand jobs uh, scheduled every hour. Uh, Spotify primarily uses batch processing. There's a little bit of streaming as well, but the, the core is really a uh, batch. Um, unfortunately, we don't really have public numbers anymore on how many computers we have since we switched to using uh, cloud infrastructure. Uh, but as of about a year ago, uh, we deprecated, or we started deprecating our Hadoop cluster, and that had 65,000 uh, cores, which were maxed out. Uh, so we kind of had to switch to a cloud. All right, so um, the talk is about Shio, which is uh, our default solution when it comes to data processing at Spotify. Uh, in a few words, Shio is a Scala API um, that we use for data processing. It works for both uh, batch and streaming pipelines, and it's open source. Um, on the right side of, of, of uh, the slide, you have a simple example of what Shio can do. So that's the infamous word count. Um, so you read a text file somewhere, you can flat map on it, do stuff with it, uh, count by value, save somewhere, and then you close the context. So it looks very much like uh, the Scala um, collection API, for example, or what you could do with Spark. Uh, you can find the source code on, on, on GitHub. So you're very welcome to come read the source code, contribute code, and, and PRs, and, and documentation if you want to. Uh, I guess we would be very happy to merge them with me. Yay. Uh, yeah, that's it. And it's, of course, free to use. Um, so a bit of context about um, Shio. So at Spotify, we have roughly 300 people using it. Um, that goes from data engineers to backend engineers and also data scientists. So that's very different um, kind of people, like I would say. Uh, we have, I think, roughly 3,000 jobs in production, something like that. Uh, and yeah, both fast and, and streaming. Um, outside of Spotify, Pew, Big, big company are using it. I think Dow Jones is using it. Uh, who else? Uh, Nine gag. If anyone likes yeah. memes. <laughs> Nine gag. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So other big companies and Spotify are actually using Shio um, to run jobs in production. 
Okay, so that comes with a few constraints for us. Um, so I'm in the team that is maintaining Shio for Spotify. Um, so over the two last years, uh, we've learned a few things. Uh, using Spotify in production uh, at scale, one of them is that not everyone can uh, know this Scala or has been writing Scala for 10 years. Um, and especially when you're working with data engineers or, and data scientists, data engineers, usually they know Scala, they know functional programming, or they know at least the basics of, it, of that. Uh, but data scientists, coding is not their primary focus. They have to do it, but um, basically their job is more about math, statistics, um, that kind of stuff, not really coding, so they're not experts, and they don't have to do to be uh, experts. That means two things for us. Uh, the first one is uh, documentation is important because we have a lot of users, uh, but my squad is actually a small team. We only four people working full time in Shio. So um, that means that when someone is going to use Shio at Spotify, um, they should be able to do anything they have to do by themselves. They shouldn't need our help. Uh, the flat mass crowd doesn't have to uh, take their hands and guide them to uh, use using Shio. They should just read documentation and figure out everything themselves. Um, the other thing that we want uh, is type safety. And, uh, well, lucky, Scala is pretty good at <coughs> The reason we want type safety is because uh, when you're writing a pipeline, especially a batch job, uh, running it is going to take hours. So you can't just write your code and deploy that and see what it's doing. That would be stupid. So you want to detect every defect, every problem with you in your code very early. So one of the choices we made in Shio is to have enough type safety that most of the common mistakes will actually be caught by the Scala compiler. You don't have to write tests or run the code. Uh, the compiler is going to do a lot of work for you. Now, of course, it's better if you write tests, so there's an API for that. <laughs> uh, one thing we, we've learned, too, is that um, one of the issues you're going to have when you write a distributed uh, program is serialization. So when you want to turn your, your instances to binary, that's going to be very complex. And on the JVM, you'll have issues with that. So that's one of the things we want to, to make easier uh, with Shio. So uh, we are now going to talk about an example of, of uh, a pipeline job that we have written a few uh, months ago at Spotify. Uh, that sort of uh, is an example of how we Shio and the benefits we get from it. Right. Um, so like I said, about a year ago, we started like, heavily deprecating our Hadoop cluster. Uh, and before we started doing that, uh, the majority of our um, jobs were written uh, in Crunch, uh, Java framework, uh, and also a little bit of scolding every, like, for the functional programmer enthusiasts. Um, so yeah, that, that was predominantly the framework we used to, uh, we used to work with. Um, but we, uh, and this was also the framework that uh, the anonymization pipelines uh, of our event delivery were written in. So as part of the Spotify privacy policy, the internal one at least, um, we try to encrypt personal data whenever we store it. And we encrypt it with uh, encryption keys that are specific to each user. So no two users should have the same keys. And that means that as part of our event delivery, we take the set of all incoming events, and we have to join that with a set of keys for each uh, uh, user. So naive implementation is on the left. It's kind of simple. Uh, just have events. You join uh, with keys based on user ID. Uh, then you encrypt and you save it. But of course, it's never really this simple, uh, because the join is quite expensive to do. Um, so the challenge that we're kind of facing is that we're dealing with uh, events. Uh, we have about 400 uh, event types. Each event type uh, runs as its own pipeline. And the biggest events uh, can be several, uh, several tens of terabytes per hour. So that means that we have, like, on the one hand, we have billions of events worth like, several tens of terabytes. And we're trying to join that with hundreds of millions of keys. Uh, that's both very I.O. intensive and very CPU intensive. So we spent a lot of money just shuffling data around. Um, the naive implementation is kind of what we used to have in Crunch. 
Of course, in crunch, since it's a bit more for both Java and you work with factory supplier, some things and you need a wide screen to fit everything. The code was a bit longer, <coughs> uh, but in essence, it just did a full shuffle join of uh, the events and the key data set. Uh, so we rewrote it uh, in Shio. Uh, we spent about three weeks going from the uh, original idea, like, hey, we can make this better, uh, to fully running this in production. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also turning off all the old systems. Uh, and we noticed that we now have much more complex pipeline logic. Um, at the same time, the code is a lot simpler to read. It's fewer lines. Uh, there's type safety, so it's a, lot, uh, it's a lot safer to change, even if someone doesn't know the full context. Um, and we can now use uh, a join strategy that's way more advanced than a shuffle join. So one of the things we try to do is we, we pick a join strategy based on the size of the incoming event. So if you have a large event like A-B testing, we'll use a different strategy than if it's a small event like video playback error, which might have only dozens of events per hour. Another thing we try to do is we predict which users will be active in a given hour. And then those users we will load on every machine that runs the job uh, and we load it in an off heap uh, uh, hash map uh, using a product called Sparky, which is also open source, also by Spotify. Um, and this allows us to super efficiently join users that we think will be active. And the remaining users we still do a full shuffle join uh, for. Uh, but it's only very few users, a few percent. And this allows us to, r to do exactly the same logic, but it's 50% cheaper than the original code. Right, so now I'm going to talk about what we are doing for uh, the next version of Shio, which we're going to release in a few weeks. Um, so it's going to be Shio 07. We are currently running Shio 06 in production of Spotify. Um, so here's you know what's coming. So we were actually breaking stuff uh, for the first time, I guess, ever uh, in, in Shio. So if you're migrating from Shio 06 to 07, uh, your code might not comply immediately. So what we do is uh, we reward the BigQuery client. Um, that's that's not too bad. It's more, it makes makes it much nicer and then a bit more consistent with the rest of of, of Shio. Uh, we reward all the IOs in Shio. That's a much bigger change. Um, so that what we want to do is to make IOs in Shio more generic. So that um, not only you could write. Uh, I use yourself and extend what, what Shio is able to do e uh, easily. Um, but also, compared to Shio 06, you don't have to deal with um, everything testing in Shio. So, um, in older version of Shio, when you were using IOs, you had to deal with, with tests. If you write an IO, you need to define what it's supposed to do when, when, when you're testing it. In, in Shio 07, that, that comes automatically. You don't have to deal with it uh, as an implementer. And the other thing is, um, IOs are, are no generic and there's new method in, in S collection and, and Shio context that allows you to just read and write and you only need to know those two methods and then you pass an IO to it and you just read and write whatever that is. You don't need to learn all the different methods that are you know, existing in Shio. Uh, the other biggest change we are making is we're introducing this concept of new colors that I'm going to talk about. Um, so Colors are what you use in Beam uh, when you need to move data between workers, which happens a lot. So basically, anytime you want to, you're processing some data and you need to move that from a worker to another worker, you need to turn that data into an array of bytes. Uh, and that's what colors do. They just take your classes, your instances, turns out into bytes, you send them over the networks, then the other worker gets the, the, the bytes and can um, deserialize that to a class. That's basic. Um, the way that this is working in uh, Shio 06 uh, is uh, that it's using a library in Java called Cryo. Um, so if you words about Cryo, who knows Cryo already? Yeah, okay, a few people. So Cryo is like this magic Java library that uses uh, reflection to guess how to serialize data and deserialize data at runtime. Um, the reason why we're using that is because that's what everyone is using. So if you use Flink or Spark or anything, 
they use cryo. And the other thing is like cryo is is easy-ish to use. It's somewhat magical. It's not the implementation is quite complex. But as a user, you just say, "Hey, I need to see your life. This, do it for me." You don't have to be very explicit about what to do. Uh, so that's nice. That makes um, Shio easy to use. But it's not a perfect solution. We wanted something more type safe uh, because obviously type safety is one of our concern and doing things at runtime is not exactly type safe. So um, the benefits of, of moving from the dynamic cryo code to, to something that's type safe and, and known by the compiler is to get a bit of predictability. So basically, whenever you're going to serialize or deserialize something, it's better if you know what the, 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 the program is going to do ahead of time. You want to know at compile time how it's going to be serialized. Uh, you, you don't really want something magical to happen. You want something that's easy to test. So uh, if you can just say, hey, give me a code for that type, and then write a test for that, that's great. That's, that's simple and easy. We want something that's fast. Obviously, we, we are um, processing terabytes of data. If we're slow, it's expensive. Um, and uh, we want something that stays automatic, despite the fact that it's not happening in runtime anymore. Um, so that's a pretty important point. We don't want to bother our users, especially data scientists, with, with things like serialization, which is like a very mundane concern that the, the framework should be doing that for you. You shouldn't be thinking about that all the time. And yet, it should be efficient. Um, so that's, that's a very big challenge. So we decided <coughs> to, to do something that, that does that automatically at compile time using a library called Magnolia. So whenever you use SHIO07 and you need a color for a type, most of the time it's going to generate it or derive it for you statically. Uh, but maybe it can't do it for reasons. And in that case, it's going to use cryo again which should be fine, hopefully. So we get like a much better option than, than before. Instead of using cryo very dynamically all the time, 90, 95% of the time, we're going to have something very static and nice. And then when it doesn't work, well, too bad, but it still works. Right, so here's how it works in, in Shio. So if you use a map function on the collection, an S collection, you used to have the signature on, on, on top. So Shio needed to have runtime information about your class, so it had a class tag. So that way, when you were trying to move something of type U from a worker to another worker, Cryo could get the type information in runtime, get a color for you, serialize everything, and, and that works. So now what we, we did is we say, very specifically, instead of saying you need a class tag, you need information about the type, we say you need a color, you need to know how you serialize that thing. So we replace that, that type constraint from a class tag to a coder so that when you map over something of type U, you get a code of U. That's it. Uh, no way. No, uh, yeah, so this is a uh, little demo of what Shio is doing. So say you have a simple class foo, it has a string and an int in it. Um, if you query the compiler, when, when I write code of foo, what I'm looking for is an implicit code of foo. So it's, it's going to be looking into the implicit scope. So essentially what it's doing is like asking the compiler, hey, can you provide a code of foo? And the compiler in that case said, hey, yeah, okay. And it can because it derived it automatically. So the compiler actually has the logic internally to generate the code of foo because it knows how to serialize a string, it knows how to serialize an integer. So obviously it knows how to serialize a product of a string and an integer. Right? That's easy. And you didn't have to do anything. Now, for a slightly more complex exam example, what happens if instead of an integer, I have something called a local, it's, which is a Java class? I cannot derive that, obviously. So I have this class funky foo, and it's, uh, it has this like, slightly weird type in it. OK, so I ask, I ask the compiler, can you give me a code for funky foo? And the compiler says, well, yeah, I can, but uh, I don't really know what to do with, with that type you're giving me a local. I'm, I'm not sure what this is. So I'm going to use cryo for that type. Now, if you were using something like normal implicit in Scala, the compiler would be failing and, and say to you, I don't know what to serialize funky food. 
he wouldn't give you uh, any information about the source of the issue. He wouldn't tell you, well, it's local. I don't know what to do with that. Um, in that case, not only are we providing a fallback so that that doesn't fail, uh, we're also uh, telling you precisely why it didn't work, like why, why is it weird, so that you can actually implement a colorful local yourself, and then you would know that everything is nice. And in the case where that uh, would fail at front time, you would know that, oh, I have to look at this because that was a bit weird. All right, so we wrote a few benchmark um, to make sure that everything was at least as fast as we require. So we had just like a couple of like, uh, simple case class uh, nested. And uh, we, we wrote a small micro benchmark that just serialized and deserialized uh, instances. So on the left, we have Java serialization. So you just externally uh, serializable. Every case class is serializable. Test that. It's very slow and very bad. And also, the output is actually very, very weak. That's pretty bad. That's a very bad option. That's why everyone is using Cryo and not that. Um, then we use Cryo with uh, registered classes. So that's typically what you would do if you were using Shield 06, Flame, Spark. That's what you're doing. So it's a lot faster. Uh, the output is a lot smaller when you're serializing. Um, so it's, it's kind of okay. Then what if we use Cryo, but we explicitly manually write um, a color for our types? So that's a lot of work. For a simple class like that, that would be probably 30, 40 lines of code. So it's typically something you don't want to do. So it's a bit faster. Um, decoding is significantly faster, and the output is slightly smaller. So yeah, that's better. Now what if you use Beam? So Beam has this concept of coder, which is not cryo. And Beam is even faster. And again, you have to write everything manually, so that's all the that work. But great. And the output is even smaller. And uh, now what we did is that a compile time, we derive the Beam coder for you. So basically, you have the same benefits. It's very fast. But you don't have to write that code yourself. The compiler does the work for you. And as you can see, it's almost as fast as writing the beam code yourself, and it's even faster than uh, custom prior codes. And the output is very small. That's great. So um, now the question is, all right, that's micro benchmark. What happens when you actually run that on the pipeline? So we did a few tests uh, on, on the pipeline, and that's like a well-behaved pipeline. Like someone that cares about performance wrote that pipeline. And as you can see, we use much less work, a bit less workers, but we also go from 60 minutes to run uh, the pipeline with a given data set to roughly 45 minutes. So it's about 25% uh, faster just by upgrading she, uh, SHIO to 07. And I think that's what we have. All right, so that's it. Uh, if this sounded interesting to you, be sure to check out the GitHub repo. Uh, also, you can reach us on Gitter, uh, which you can also find the link on the GitHub repo. Uh, or you can send Julianne messages on Twitter. Uh, I don't really use Twitter. <laughs> so you can use the same handle, but at Spotify and uh, at Spotify.com, and you can email me on that. And if you want to work with us on Shio, check out SpotifyJobs.com. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, guys.